I'm going to let Jen push her button here. <laughs> it's a magic button Jen pushes. There so. you go. Welcome to the class, New Year, New Hobby. I'm so glad to welcome you here. I'm Amy Karanik, and I'm a brand ambassador for Sculpey, and I'm in the Sculpey studio. And Felicia, just so I can keep track of myself, um, myself and my overhead are both in the gallery view. So can you make me, can somebody make me bigger so I can see what I'm doing? So your front camera is already spotlighting you. Oh, but to me, it's not. Probably not, but everyone else should see. Okay. That's you. Okay, good. So All right. we're ready to go overhead. They should see just. No, your not, not yet. Um, I just want to reiterate what Felicia said that if you have questions, please type them in the chat. We would love to answer your questions in real time. And um yeah, we love to know where you're from. And if you're new to polymer clay, that helps us understand our audience. If you're a beginner, intermediate, advanced, and welcome. Thanks for coming. And Felicia, now I'm ready to go to overhead and I'm going to introduce our today's um, projects. Okay, so everything we're using today is available at Michael's. And this is the Primo and Souffle multi-pack. Um, it's half Primo, 12 12 one ounce bars of Primo, 12 one ounce bars of souffle. And what's so cool about it is the Primo has a lot of accents like glitter and granite and pearl colors. The souffle are all opaque and they can be mixed together, which I'm gonna show you some ideas with that today. And you can make your own totally custom colors by mixing them or using them straight out of the package. So it's a great way to start if you're new to oven baked clay. Um, also today, we are making three pairs of earrings, and I guess, I don't know if they're right side up or upside yeah, down, but good. okay. Um, we're making all the cutters that we're using in today's lineup came and are available from Michael's. We've got the Monstera leaves, we've got this rainbow shape, and we have, this one's actually called a pendant set. It comes with a big shape and a duplicate smaller shape, which are completely the same shape, but different sizes. It was designed for making pendants, but I used it to make some earrings. So those are the cutters we're using. The clay I've already showed you. We're gonna make um, these great little terrazzo monstera leaves. We're gonna marble up some clay to make these cool, um, very laid back rainbows. And then we're gonna add mica powder to a texture to make um, these really neat um, shiny earrings here. So let's get started. I'm going to set some of these out of the way. And we will focus on the Monstera leaves first. And I chose to use the bigger cutter in the set. It comes in two sizes. You can use, obviously, use whichever size you want. I just like to use the big ones when I'm working on camera because it's a bigger landscape that you can see. Um, more readily. Okay, so the background of our Monstera leaves is is called Igloo Souffle. So our souffle clay um, has this beautiful matte texture to it when it's baked, um, and it comes. The colors of it are all very designer color names, and this one is called Igloo. Um, all I'm doing is I have already conditioned, and what I mean by condition is. I'm getting that clay soft and ready to go. Um, as soon as I take it out of the package, I'm either conditioning it by hand like you see now, or I'm conditioning, conditioning it through a pasta machine. Um, either way is fine. You just wanna get your clay working and ready to go. So I've already conditioned this igloo and then I've rolled it flat with my acrylic roller. Now, just to give you an idea, this is close to 1 8 inch thick. And if you were using a pasta machine, that would be your thickest setting. So I've got this about one eighth, one eighth inch thick. And the great thing about both souffle and Primo is it's very strong even when it's thin and it's still somewhat flexible after baking. So this is a good thickness I know um, for earring making. So just to give you a little further information, um, the thickest setting on a pasta machine or the second or even the third can make some nice lightweight thin earrings. The next thing I want to do is double check that I have enough, you know, material here to get this big monstera leaf out twice. And I feel quite confident that I do. Um, I'm going to show you how to do this cool terrazzo pattern. 
And I love the terrazzo technique because you can just make a little bit, you don't waste a lot of clay. Um, it's beautiful, it's very modern, it's up to date. You could interchange any colors that you want um, to make your own color palette. What I have in my hand now is just a piece of conditioned gray granite Primo and I'm pinching it super duper thin with my fingers. And then to take it even a little step further, I'm gonna roll it with my, with my clay roller. I wanna get this really, really thin. And then we're going to start building our terrazzo pattern. Now, when I build a terrazzo pattern, like you see here, um, I always start with um, a big area in the background and kind of work with smaller pieces in the foreground. So um, I'm, I'm just tearing the gray granite off of this very thin sheet and randomly assorting it down onto my background. Okay. And when I, another tip I'd like to offer for terrazzo is that um, so in the gray granite, I've kept my sizing, except for maybe that one there, I've kept my sizing kind of the same. This is going to be like my biggest area is this gray granite. And so I've kept the size of each piece sort of similar, and then I'll do smaller pieces in other colors. Okay. The next color I'm going to lay down is going to be souffle in... Is it pumpkin, Jen? Yes. <laughs> we used to have this color called sweet potato. <laughs> that was in a different brand. And so my brain always wants to go back to sweet potato, but it's actually called pumpkin. <laughs> so thanks for the help. All right, I've pinched some pumpkin down and I've gotten it really, really thin. And so I'm just gonna do the same thing and I'm gonna tear off some bits. These ones are generally gonna be a bit smaller than the gray granite, and I'm gonna let them overlap quite a bit. I'm gonna let them overlap the gray granite because that's one of the ways that keeps me kind of acting random. Hey, um, Amy, yes. how long does clay stay conditioned? Okay, so um, that's a really good question. Like this clay that I'm using here, I, I developed this project um a long time ago and I just grabbed the same clay bars and I just pinched off what I needed but I did recondition it so if you don't already have like your pattern going if you have just wads of solid color clay I would all anytime I'm starting a new project on the day I would I would kind of recondition that or resheet it um but if you've already gotten your pattern established like for example I think uh, this, this classroom was developed in about October. Mm -hmm. And this is a clay I made in October. And it is still flexible and good to go. I could cut earrings right out of this piece. That's why I brought it, just in case I messed this up. Um, this was made in October and it's still, you know, good to go. So um, once, once you work with polymer clay for a while, you're going to be able to, to determine, you know, um, if you feel like you can keep working with it or not. Now, another tip I will give you on this, let's back up to this for a second, because that was a really good question. Okay, I have this plastic deli wrap is what I stored this clay on. That has helped keep this clay fresh. All of our clay has plasticizer in it, which makes it pliable. So if I had stored this on something absorbent, it would not be usable today because that beautiful plasticizer would have gone into the absorbent, you know, absorbency. But since I stored it on a plastic, this could even be kitchen wrap or a deli sheet like this. It didn't allow the plasticizer to go away from the clay. It stayed right in there and that helped keep it fresh too. Now, how do you know when your clay is conditioned enough? Okay, so to know if your clay is conditioned enough, and by the way, as I'm working, I'll just, I'll keep working and answering this question. This now that I'm uh, putting down in yet even a smaller pattern is called um, Primo Twin, uh, Galaxy Glitter. Okay, so how do you know when your clay is conditioned well enough? Well, the way I tell is that um, if I take a piece off of the bar 
and I just start working it. At first, um, it's going to have like these raggedy, maybe sort of crumbly edges to it. And as I work it, especially by hand or through a pasta machine, the raggedy crumbly edges will, will go away and become more part of the, the overall feel. And so it might start out sort of crumbly and a little raggedy. And then as you condition that will go away and then you'll know. Okay, so that's my um, galaxy glitter and I've put that down. And each time I've added a color, I've kind of changed its size range and made it smaller and smaller so that by the time I get to my top layer, which is gonna be souffle and bluestone, it will be the smallest element. And so this is um, bluestone in souffle. And what I'm gonna do this time is I'm going to shape this into kind of a little really skinny rope because I want my top layer of bluestone to be really different than my background ones. And that's just a matter of, of my own preference. So I've got this real skinny rope and I'm just gonna pull some of these off as they will and put them over the tops of these in a, in a random fashion. And each layer that I added, I rolled it into the background with my acrylic clay roller so that this surface is super flat. There's no lumps and bumps, there's no texture. Um, it's just super flat, borrowing from its inspiration, which is terrazzo um, flooring. Like if you go to a big commercial building, you'll see terrazzo on the floor. That's like this beautiful poured um, multicolored finish. And th that's kind of what we're mimicking here. Okay, so there's my little bits and pieces. I'm gonna roll this one again. Okay, and I really love the way that looks. And it looks slightly different than my initial sample. It looks, it looks a little different than the one I did earlier, but it's still beautiful. It doesn't always have to be the same. Now I just need to audition where I would like to cut out a couple of these big Monstera leaves. And then those will be ready to go in my home oven at 275 for 30 minutes. So both Primo and Souffle, they bake at the same time and the same temperature, which is another great um, quality because you can use them together and interchangeably. And you don't have to worry about adjusting um, time and temperature or anything like that. Okay, the final thing I wanna do I want to orient these to my, you know, to my face and I need to poke a hole so that um, later when I go take these out of the oven and I start assembling them with jump rings and earring findings, it has a hole already in place. And so I'll just take this, this is a blunt point tool and on the other end it has a ball. This comes in our clay tool starter set and I like this blunt point so I'll just poke it in. I'm leaving about an eighth of an inch between my hole and the edge of the clay. So there's a nice strong connection there for that jump ring to go in. And then I'll pull these up very carefully. I always flip them over and go back the other way because anytime you push a tool through the clay, it's gonna leave a little rim on the other side. And so I'm pushing that little rim back inside the hole just to make a really nice, neat hole that the jump ring can function inside of. So these are ready to be baked, 275 in your home oven. And then later I'll show you how to assemble them into earrings, okay? So I'm gonna put that one aside and we'll move on to our next technique. So the next one is going to be the rainbow, um, these funky laid back rainbows. And I used the bigger cutter again. Um, it comes in two sizes. They come together in one cutter set. And then I have here, this is Primo in frost white glitter. And I don't know if you can see it, but frost white glitter has this, um, has glitter right inside. And that's like a, um, you know, go straight to the bling factor, which, which I love the bling factor. So I want to show you a marbling technique 
um, that I use to achieve these very loosey goosey marble affected earrings. They're not real, um, they're very loose and abstract, the marbling. It's not overbearing or overpowering. It's just like real streaky. And so I'm gonna to try to duplicate that again today. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with a little log. This is about half the bar, uh, half of the one ounce bar of the frost white glitter. And so I'm just making a little log. And then what I have here for my pink is I actually mixed from the pack. I mixed the cherry pie and I mixed, um, you could mix cherry pie with either frost white glitter or with igloo, either one to get, I think it's frost white glitter because um, this, this is blingy too. I can see the glitter inside of it. Okay, so, so let's go back to the conditioning question. You asked, how do I know it's conditioned? Okay, this wad of clay is from October when I designed this class. And as I picked it up and I'm conditioning, I can see little rough places, like right along here. I can see those little rough places. And so I want to work those back in and make the clay ball smooth again before I use it today. And probably part of the problem is I wasn't as careful about storing this lump of clay um, as I was with that sheet of terrazzo I showed you earlier from October, I probably just kind of let, let whatever happened happen. <laughs> okay, so now what I want with this pink glittery clay is a little tiny log. So I'm just going to roll it down. And this clay is moving really quickly because this room is really warm. And so I'm just going to put a log of this on top of the, just a really thin little log on top of that frost white glitter log. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing with this, um, I think this one's called uh, 18 karat gold, and this is a Primo color. I'm gonna roll down a tiny log. And I'm gonna add it about a third of the way around. Okay, and then my last color is just gonna be a tiny bit of black. And you can see that proportionately, I'm using way more of the frost white than I am the pink or the gold. And that's how I got that really loose, loosely marbled effect. If you used equal amounts of each color, you would get more of a, a modeled um, effect, which could be beautiful too. This was just a matter of preference that we kind of wanted them to look real, real ma uh, loose and and with thin lines. Okay, so now I have this log with the three stripes on it and I'm just gonna roll it until those stripes become part of the log, kind of like making candy. And then I'm going to loosely twist this, not real tight. And this is how you make a twisted rope, okay? But I don't want my stripes to be all organized like that. So the next thing I did was I rolled this up into a ball, like, or a coil. I rolled this up into a coil, which kind of confused the, that striping that we had. And now I'm going to roll it into a ball. So I'm like going every which shape I can with this, <laughs> just to get some real disorganized marbling. That's what I'm going for, is disorganized marbling. Now there's so many techniques that you can do with clay and a lot of them are quite organized and a lot of them are quite unorganized. And it just depends on your, you know, your system of style and how you like to present your creativity. Um, you can go on sculpey.com and just find so many free tutorials and um, you know, you can get so much good inspiration that's speaks to your heart of creativity and helps you make what you want to make. So I'm just showing you a few methods today. All right, so I've got some real confused striping going there and I, I like that. It's still very loose with a lot of, um, a lot of the white is coming through. And next I'm gonna flatten this. And I'm kind of looking at the ball and flattening it out in a way that gives me some of the gold, some of the pink and some of the black. Okay, and now I'm gonna roll it with my roller. 
Okay. okay. And right away, as I'm rolling it and spreading it, that black is way too heavy. That's not what I want. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to fold this kind of in again and get things to kind of thin a bit. I'm folding some of that black inward. And now I've got some very more, you know, disorganized striping going and I like that better. So I'm gonna try again. Rolling up that ball just to smooth it. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll it out again. And this time I'm liking better what I see. It's just like, it's like um, little veins of color going through instead of so much blotchy color going through. And that was from manipulating that clay and getting it to do, you know, what I wanted it to. So I like that, but let's, let's go one more time and see what happens. This is really neat here, but it's not really enough information for two earrings to share that. So let's see if we can get a little bit more stuff going on by manipulating this one more time. It's very playful. You just gotta play with it. <laughs> I'm giving you permission to play. If that's what you need, I'm giving it to you. That's where the creativity comes out is when we play and we're not, not so hung up on the outcome. We just let it flow. And this is looking so much more like what I want. Okay, now I'm gonna flatten it out again. And I don't have as much pink there, but I think it's okay. It's still looking really, I'm not gonna do it again. I'm just gonna enjoy what I've got here. Um, because you can go too far and get it mixed totally into something, you know, that's like a neutral color. <laughs> so I'm just going to be thankful for what I've got here. And, and I really do kind of like it. If you look at it, it's got like bright pink that fades off through the white and you've got that black turning to gray and you've got some streaks of gold. I like that. We're going to go with that. So now I'm just rolling it thin so it makes a nice delicate earring shape. I'm going to double check that my I have enough real estate here to, to cut out two of these, and I do. So now we get to cut. Make sure you've got your folded edge up by your hand and that your cutter edge is going you know, downward through the clay. I think I want to go more like this this time. All right. Okay, this is kind of a, it's kind of a delicate shape, this cutter, because it's so long and skinny. So let me show you how to reshape that, which you would definitely want to address before you put this in the oven. Okay, you would want to make sure that your the legs of the rainbow, you know, are going quite straight. Just visually eyeball that a bit. I might even do this step right here of lining the legs up right on my baking pan so that I don't have to move it again. I might just get my baking pan, lay this on there, make it the way I want it, and then stick it in the oven. So for this design, we've got a little hole right up here and right up here. And I'm not gonna flip these over like I did the other time because like I said, these legs are so you know delicate and I don't wanna, to mess them up. So I'll show you how to finish that into earrings in just a little bit. For now, I'm just gonna move these out of my way so that we can work on the next um, the next pair. And you know, I gotta say, I kind of like that pair better than my sample pair, Jen. <laughs> like okay. <laughs> All right, I'm using a baby wipe to clean my hands. Baby wipes are great for cleaning your tools. Paper towels are as well. I use a lot of sharp blades and they make nice cuts if I keep them clean. Um, and I'm also gonna clean my work surface. This work surface is a silicone um, work mat that, uh, that Sculpey has. And so it cleans off really easily. Hey, Amy. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about like how much clay to use for earrings? Yes, I, that's a great question. So um, let me show you in this set, that I keep referring to the Primo and Souffle set. 
the bars look like this out of the package. It's a one ounce bar. And the background that I'm using for each set today is approximately half of this. Now that's just the background. It doesn't include like the little strings of color. It's just the background piece, okay? So for like the, um, the terrazzo piece, uh, this is what I had left over. I probably had double this amount um, to do the terrazzo with the galaxy glitter. Um, and I have that much left. So that is like a smidgen of clay. So your background that you're using for the base, like the white for the monstera leaves, the frost white for the rainbows, that'd be about a half of this, which would be a half an ounce, okay? If you buy open stock um, clay at Michael's, um, that's gonna be quite a bit bigger bar. It's gonna be a two ounce bar. So it's double the one that comes in that pack. And so you could buy only the colors that you want and it would come in a two ounce bar and then you could do the math to see how many pairs of earrings you could get out of that. So, okay, so this is about a half ounce of clay right here. And this again is the um, igloo and souffle. And I am going to um, do this pair of earrings, which is a textured earring with some mica powder on the top. Let me hold these up. So you can see they're quite lovely. They have three colors of mica powder plus a texture. And then the little bobbles at the top, um, that was our, our Primo um, in copper. Okay, so I've already this out to an eighth of an inch thick and I have there for my, for my base cut. And the first thing I wanna do is texture it. And I'm using this really cool texturing rod these are available at Michael's. It came in a two pack. Um, one is like flowers and vines and the Sorry, the one is sort of a, um, hey, Amy. Hello. Yes. Right. Can you kind of start that particular little section over again? It kind of cut out on us. Okay, thanks for telling me, Felicia. <laughs> okay, so um, I have the white in souffle and glue rolled out to an eighth of an inch thick. And then I'm going to texture it with these rolling texture bars that are available at Michael's. Are we good so far? So far, so good. Okay, great. Um, this came in a two pack. One is flowers and vines. And one is, it's sort of a rainbow shape or scallops or fish scales. I'm not sure what it's called. And I'm just going to use this to roll a texture into the clay. So I'll just, I have this really stuck down to my work surface here. And I'm just gonna roll this with a lot of pressure. So it gets a really nice deep texture. The deeper the texture, um, the more the highlights of the mica powder are gonna show up. So I'm just starting right on the edge and I'm pushing hard and I'm rolling. Now I'm stopping here and there because my clay is actually sticking to the roller and I just wanna put it back down. Okay. I'm just going to peel that off there real gently. And I think I actually rolled with too much pressure, <laughs> which I have a tendency to do. Okay, so now you have um, this beautiful texture right in the clay. And I, I think I can't really see it, but I'm hoping that you'll be able to see it better when we get to the mic powder. You can see it. Okay, you can see it? Okay. So anyway, here's my white and the mica powder I'm using came in a 12 pack set from Michael's. And wouldn't you know, I peeled the back off that and recycled it. And now I don't know what the names of these are. <laughs> so just pick out three mica powders that coordinate well and that you like, and you can go from there. <laughs> okay. So what you could do is, is if you want to, you could cut your earring shape out first. That way um, you're not, uh, if you put mica powder over the whole sheet, then you won't have any straight white clay anymore. So let's just go ahead and cut out 
um, our base shapes. And uh, this time I'm kind of cutting them out symmetrically so that the same pattern of the rainbows is on each piece. So they kind of match. Hey, Amy, if yes. has chalk instead of mica powder, can they do that? Instead? Yes, you can use chalk instead of mica powder. You could use glitter instead of mica powder. Um, you could use herbs and spices. Um, yeah, <laughs> you could use a lot of stuff, okay? So whatever I'm doing with the mica powder, you can do with those other things. Now, I will say though that um, I'm just gonna tap these down so that they're not all up when I open it up. Um, I will say though that if you use something different than what I'm doing today, you might want to test it on a baked piece of clay and make sure that it's not gonna rub off on your fingers after it's baked. Like these mica powders, they have set really well on the clay and joined with it in the baking process. So I know that it's not gonna come off. I can't speak to that effect for every single thing. And I know I have, I think, pretty sure I have the wrong color here. So I'm just gonna shift gears real quick. What about sealing it with something? If you want to seal it, um, you can seal it with, um, we have, a Sculpey makes a glaze in both glossy and in um, matte or satin, and you could seal it with that. So if you wanted to. Okay, so I like to use my finger in the lid and just get a little bit of this and just smear it on. And I'm doing this, you know, kind of in a, a planned way. Some people even do this with makeup, um, you know, like eyeshadow or yeah, people are asking about. Eyeshadow. Yeah, if you have like old eyeshadow or blush, um, you can use you can use makeup too. Good way to get rid of like makeup that oh maybe I shouldn't have bought that color. <laughs> so okay, so I'm just kind of going around the edges with this really dark color, kind of a. It's kind of a bronzy brown. Can you see the textures now better as mm -hmm. I'm adding color? Now I'm wiping that brown off my finger because I probably should have started with the light color first and I didn't. So let's go to the light color now. Can you use something else if you don't want to use your finger? Um, you color? could use, yeah, you can. Um, the reason I use my finger is because it doesn't get down in the textures. And I'm trying to leave the textured areas white because that's what really makes the design pop. Um, you don't wanna use like a paintbrush or something because it will deposit the mica down in, down in the crap, in the texture. So you can use whatever you want to, but I know that my finger won't deposit the mica, you know, in the wrong places. Does that make sense? So this is a kind of a light pink that I'm putting all in the middle. And I am, I am letting it get into the areas where the, uh, that darker color is so that they kind of blend. Always put the lid back on and don't sneeze. <laughs> and then my third color is sort of a real shiny copper. So this one still has some in the lid and that's why I like to put my finger in the lid. I use the lid as like a, a dauber to get the excess off. So I'm getting all around the edges with this copper color. And then I'm also going back and looking for spots that have no color and putting it there. So. I like it, looks good. Okay, so there's our three micas and a textured look. So now for the little top bobbles, I just need a bit of Primo and the um, copper color. And I'm just gonna smooth that down and cut out my little bitty guys for the top portion, two of those. Okay. Then what you want to do, since this is a like a stacked earring situation, um, I want to line these up in like imagining how they would come together as actual earrings and that the top bit would be hooked to the bottom bit by a jump ring. 
And so I'm going to need holes in both of those. And that's why I'm lining them up real well so that I can get my holes in just the right place. So I'm going to go in here with my blunt tool again, my blunt point, and I'm going to act like I'm drilling those little holes out with this tool. And I'm leaving, you know, a little margin of clay between the hole and the edge of the shape so that it'll be strong. Okay. And then I will flip these over and make sure to push that little rim of clay back into inside the hole and set these aside for baking as I finish off with that hole. This is very cool for me because I usually don't get to see so many um, beautiful faces on the screen. Usually I'm, I can only see around the edges and today for some reason I can see a lot of you and I love that. <laughs> You look so good. It's good to be together creating. Okay, one more. All right. So are there any basic questions about the, the unbaked clay or about the process before I go on and show you how to assemble with jump rings? We're good? Okay. Oh, well, someone wants to know if you can over condition clay. Not really. <laughs> I've never done it. <laughs> uh, I, I don't believe you can. If you're getting it that soft, you just need to stop and make something. <laughs> okay, so let's start here. And what I'm going to do is just take these apart and then put them back together so you can see how it works. Um, I always use um, two sets of pliers when I'm uh, doing jump rings. The pliers are really just an extension of your fingers. There's nothing magical about pliers. And I'm gonna take this apart and show you how it goes. So you, and jump rings come in so many colors and so many options. And you could, so you could do gold tone, silver tone, you can do fine jewelry, brass, copper, whatever you want. And um, you could use jump rings as large or small as you want. They all work pretty much the same. And I just happen to do silver with these. So you can see this one that's still connected. I have a little bit bigger jump ring to accommodate the clay. Then I have a tiny jump ring. What that tiny jump ring is doing is changing the orientation 90 degrees. So if I if my first jump ring was this way, the second one makes it go that way. And then that way, as you put as you build the earring, you can make sure that it's going to hang on your face uh, by your face appropriately. So that's why I used two jump rings to change change the orientation so that the 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 leaves end up by my face, not parallel to my face. Okay? So, and you'll get that once you start experimenting. All I do is just pick a jump ring that's large enough to go through that hole and around the edge of the clay. And I'm using these pliers as an extension of my fingers just to get it up in there through that hole. Could have used a bigger jump ring, but this one, I like to use a jump ring that's at least large enough for the little elements to swing. Okay. And then you would add the smaller jump ring and the ear wire. And then that leaf would end up being, you know, right beside your face instead of, it would end up perpendicular to your face so that it's showing. All right, let me give you a little quick tutorial on jump ring opening. Okay, I'll pick a larger one, a larger jump ring here. This is about an eight or nine millimeter jump ring, which is a really common size. What I do when I'm opening them is I always put the little gap, the opening gap face up toward me. And then I grab on each side of that gap with pl flat pliers and then I twist. And so I'm gonna twist one plier toward me and one plier away, okay? That is the proper way to open a jump ring. So what you're doing is you're opening the jump ring wire like this, okay? You're twisting it, you're not expanding it. Jump rings are created with wire that wants to go back. 
the way it was, which holds it closed. And if you stretch it, you're removing its ability to go back. So when you twist it, it still can go back to how it was manufactured. So now to close the jump ring, I'm gonna grab it again from both sides with the, with the pliers. I'm gonna twist the opposite way, one away from me and one toward me. And I'm using enough tension in my hands to make those two things join right together at the seam. I don't want this, I don't want that, I don't want this. I want the jump ring to kiss right there at its original location and that's the most strongest it can be. Okay, so that's how that was done. Um, these rainbow earrings, I used a jump ring actually as an accent. So what I have here is like a 10 millimeter or a one centimeter jump ring that I put there. And remember how we talked about the first jump ring goes through and it makes the, the rainbow um, be in direct, you know, coordination with your face so it'll be seen. This one turns it the wrong way and then this one turns it back to the same way that one was. So each time you add a jump ring, you're turning the art 90 degrees. And so the three, this jump ring, this jump ring, and the ear wire, which had the little eye at the bottom, those three together put it back in the, the orientation that you want so that it's beside your face, okay? But this jump ring just acts as an accent piece and just makes it a little more decorative and stylish. This pair is done in a little bit different way. We have the jump ring here to connect the two, but at the back, we would be adding a little ear post and we would just glue um, a, an ear post that won't show. It needs to be small enough to glue right there. And then you would wanna let the glue dry. Sometimes we don't glue them on because we're taking pictures of them and things and we want them to lay really flat <laughs> for the photos. So that's why these aren't finished with posts. Okay, so all of the pieces that you've made get baked 30 minutes in your home oven um, I have some at 275. Okay, let's, ha let's hear them. How do you know when it's done? Um, maybe, um, Felicia, can we go back to my face <laughs> instead of the overhead? Can we spotlight me? Okay, can you see me? Okay, how do you know when it's done? So what we do to know it's done is we rely heavily on the manufacturer's instructions. <laughs> and every single bar of clay comes with those instructions. They're also available on the website, sculpey.com. And so the manufacturer's instructions for both Primo and Souffle are 275 degrees, which you will calibrate your oven to with an oven thermometer. Okay, so you know it's 275 for 30 minutes. Now that 30 minutes is stipulated per quarter inch of thickness. So if you're building really large, bulky, thick things and they're getting thicker than a quarter of an inch, you would bump up your baking time. Every quarter of an inch would go up 30 minutes. And the great thing about Primo and Souffle, which is what we're using here today, is that they bake at the same time and the same temperature. So you can bank on it if your oven is absolutely 275 and you know it and you're going for 30 minutes because you're using a timer, then you know it's done. When you know it's not done is when, like, let's say your oven, you think it's 275, but it's really only 250. Um, if you baked that way, your pieces might look done, but they would break easily. And so that's why it's super important to understand that your oven temperature is accurate and that your timing is accurate. As long as you go by time and temperature, you'll know it's done. And how long do you let it cool? I let it cool until I can pick it up. <laughs> okay, and it's important to let it cool. Uh, I shouldn't say I let it cool till I pick it up. I let it cool till it's cool because that also makes the piece solid and strong to allow it to cool all the way back to it's um, cool, you know, to cool, to room temperature. Um, that lets all that curing process run its full cycle. So I always let things cool completely before handling them. And can you talk about some baking surfaces? Yes. 
So baking surfaces would include metal, glass, um, silicone baking sheets like I worked on today. Um, you can bake on cardstock or even paper. You can bake on baking parchment or aluminum foil and ceramic tiles. Um, the only difference would be if you're not baking on a metal or glass or ceramic tile that's very rigid, if you for some reason wanna bake on paper, let's say you don't have dedicated craft pans and you're baking on your kitchen baking sheets that you're gonna again use for cookies or pizza, <laughs> you might wanna just put a barrier between your clay and the baking sheet and you could use paper. Well, this is one place that I'm gonna back up and say, if you're baking on paper, um, because paper will not burn until over 400 degrees and we're baking at 275, the paper is going to be safe. But when paper cools, it warps and bends. And if you allow your clay project to stay on the paper as it cools, as the paper warps and bends, it's gonna warp and bend your clay project. So that is the one time that I would get in there with hand protection and I would move, carefully move my clay project off of that paper onto a steady surface where it can cool and not suffer the warping and bending of the paper. So did I, yep. did I make all that clear? <laughs> and then can you overbake the clay? You can overbake, you can overbake Primo and Souffle by temperature. Let's say your oven has a tendency to escalate in temperature like go above our baking temperature, our ideal baking temperature is 275. Let's say your oven wants to go 285 or 290 without you knowing it. By the time it gets up to about 300, the clay will scorch. And that means it will darken and turn. It will, it will burn. It will actually burn your project up around 300. So you want to make sure you understand that your oven is calibrated at 275 for your crafts and you can bake it all day long at 275 but if you get up too hot say closer to 300 then you're going to notice scorching and discoloration so what i do is i have a hamilton beach um toaster oven it's quite large um, the, they're very easy to come by and they're very reliable. I have that as my dedicated clay oven. You can bake in your kitchen oven. That's not a problem. But I bake so much and so often and my KitchenAid toaster oven has a built-in timer and I know I can, it's very reliable. I know the temperature's good. I know the timer's good. I can walk away from it and it'll turn itself off after 30 minutes. And so I love having a dedicated clay oven but I've been at this a while and I do it almost every day. So until, you know, you can use your kitchen oven until you decide you don't want to use your kitchen oven. <laughs> what about covering the clay when baking? Okay, so there's a few instances where some artists like to cover or what we call tent the clay. And I'm saying tent like T-E-N-T, -E like tent. <laughs> um, we haven't had it in our project today, but there is a color of clay called translucent. And some artists heavily use translucent. They use it for like um, light conductivity, like light going through it, or some artists use a lot of translucent to make flesh tones, to make sculptures that have like more of a, you know, a light emitting translucence to them. And those types of artists, a lot of times like to put a tent, a T-E-N-T -E over their clay. Oh, someone's holding some, something up there. Is translucent. that translucent yeah. clay? And so sometimes they like to do that because through their own good trial and their own good work ethic, they know that tent, tenting translucent clay um, can help them bake it longer without it. Translucent might be the one area where if you bake it too long, it would go kind of amber or it might shift in color. And so to preserve that, they, they might tent their, tent their clay. Another way that people tent or cover clay is if they're using a lot of clay in their kitchen oven, 
they might set up like a little Dutch oven that they put their clay into. And so what they're doing is they're kind of, oh, which, can you tell what that is, Jen, that she's holding up? I, is it translucent? Yeah, translucent. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I really, that's what's so great about being live and being together is the sharing. Um, some people will create a, a Dutch oven inside their oven. They feel more confident about having, like now they've created a covered oven inside the oven. And hey, Amy? Yes. I'm going to ask Tanya if she could hold that up one more time for us. Okay. That'd be great. Hey, Tanya. And can should we unmute her? her? Is, is, it, is, it, uh, is she full screen now, Jen? Because mine's still gallery. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> Thank you so much. So that's another way is that people might make a covered oven and put that inside their oven with for baking. Okay. <laughs> All right. Are there are there a any more questions. couple more questions? Let's have them. We've got seven more minutes. Yeah. Um about sanding clay. Can people mm -hmm. just use regular sandpaper? Mm. Maybe it's something special. I'm so glad you asked about sanding because look at this beautiful pendant I'm wearing from. Mili Angulo in Lima, Peru. This, she is a sanding queen. <laughs> okay, so when you sand clay, especially if you're sanding to a high sheen polish, which is what this is, this has no coating on it. It's just polymer clay sanded to a high sheen polish. What you do is you can use, um, you wanna use wet, dry sandpaper. You start about 400. 600, 800, 1,000. Mealy probably went to about 1,200 on this piece and then buffed it with a buffing wheel. Now, we like to use wet, dry sun, sandpaper and I like to use it wet because the water helps <laughs> wash all that grit away that you're sanding off. It also keeps the clay from getting warm while you're sanding it. And that's important. You don't want to sand, you don't want to warm up the clay because then it's going to get softer and go through its curing process. So you use wet, dry sandpaper, start at 400, 600, 800, 1000, go up as high as you want. And then you can polish that piece with a buffing wheel or, or a denim cloth or a cotton cloth. And it will absolutely shine just like, like this pendant piece does. This has an absolutely slick as glass finish on it just from sanding and polishing. Good question. <laughs> we have another question. Okay. About canes. <laughs> so someone <laughs> has, her husband has a bunch of canes that he was gonna use to make pens, but she wants to texture them. Mm. So she's like, can I texture them even though they already have a pattern? Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, can she tell me, like in the chat, are these old canes yes. or new canes? They're old? Yeah. She's okay. Be... They're old canes yeah. that you want to get some life out of. Okay. So here's what I'd like to say. And let's pretend that this is a cane. And for people who don't know, you know what? A can... Jen's going to go I'm get gonna a go cane. Grab She's going to go grab a cane. Um, a cane is a... It's a, a bar of clay that someone has assembled in multicolors. Yay, Jen. Jen just brought me this clay sampler little thing. And Jen and I yesterday filmed a caning video that's gonna be on our website. So I'll just take this one. It's not the most intricate cane, but it's probably real easy to see, or even this one bigger. This one has a flower in it. And so what you do is you construct that cane in a way that that two-dimensional image of the flower runs all the way through the cane three-dimensionally. And then what artists do is they slice these very thinly and they use those to decorate, like to make earrings or to apply thin slices of the cane in a veneering fashion. Um, over something else. So that's what a cane is. Now, if you have old canes, and here's the beauty of it. Once you make a cane, what artists do is they reduce them by squeezing them and making them longer. And so you're actually reducing 
this big flower down to this medium sized flower down to this smaller flower. And I could keep reducing this and stretching it until basically you could keep doing that until you can't even see the flower. Okay, so you can reduce it as much as the eye can see. Okay, so here's what I wanna say and about using old canes. You can use old canes, but they're gonna take some finessing, okay? So let's say this is an old cane. You wanna take a really careful slice from that old cane. And then what I would do with that old cane piece um, is that I would start warming it with my fingers by pinching it, okay? And that would help send some of your body heat through the old clay. Because earlier in the day, someone asked me um, about conditioning clay. Well, you don't wanna condition this because you're gonna ruin your cane. So what you can do is just treat each slice individually. I'm not conditioning it. I'm just sending my body heat through it by pinching it like this. Oh, you are highlighting my hands. Thank you. Yeah, God, that's so camera. smart. Okay, so I'm just pinching it. And then I can feel it moving just a bit. That means it's warming up. It's warm all the way through. Now, if you wanted to texture that, whoever asked the texturing question, if you want to texture that, you certainly could. Um, you could use, maybe if you used a very fine texture, like sandpaper or uh, one of my favorite really fine textures is, is called stair tread. It is the stair tread off of stairs and it comes in fine sheets and you could texture that, but it is gonna distort, you know, that image that's in your cane. So without seeing the cane, I don't know how far you wanna take that, but you definitely could. Okay, did we answer that question? <laughs> No more questions? No, I think we're good. <laughs> okay, so um, Felicia, if you put my face back up there, I'm gonna tell my people, um, thank you for coming. Thanks for having a new year and a new hobby with me and with Jen and, and Felicia and Michaels. Um, we would love to see what you've created. So if you have the knack for posting to social media, if you could use some hashtags, then we could find your work and we could be inspired by it. We like it if you can use the hashtag Sculpey, hashtag uh, how, how do you Sculpey. Michaels likes, you could do hashtag Michaels and hashtag make it with Michaels. I think I've got all the hashtags covered. And that way we can see your work. It'll pop up for us and we'll be like, hey, they, what an inspiring way to use our clay. And we would love that. So this video will be ready for you to view and replay and rewind and test out everything we did today and, and relearn um, in a, like a couple days, right, Jen? And that'll be on YouTube. Michaels, Michaels oh, YouTube. Michaels, yep. Michaels, Michaels YouTube, but you'll get the notification that it's ready to watch. So I can't thank you enough for being with me and spending this time together and love you and bye-bye. <laughs>